good to know. Um, so let me introduce myself really quickly um, uh, and let you know what's going to happen this morning. We're, um, I'm, I'm, my name's Fran Richardson. I know some of you, but not all of you. And um, we are expecting a few more people. So apologies if my eyes keep drifting to the, um, the, the admit people box. Um, my name's Fran. I work for Action with Communities in Cumbria and I manage the community-led homes hub for Cumbria and Lancaster. Um, and what that means is that we work with um, groups taking a really positive community development um, approach to tackling housing problems. Um, and these conversations that we've got lined up today touch on some of the issues that are really um, at the top of the list for communities to be exploring. So things like affordability, which is what we'll be talking about specifically this morning. Um, uh, looking at how people um, how, how people's housing needs change as they get older and what sort of community they choose to be part of and um, thinking about how people use empty buildings and use them as an opportunity to do really good positive things in their communities that so we've got some wonderful speakers coming later in the day to talk about that um, and we're also um, hearing from uh, the Marmalade Lane people in Cambridge who um, have, have, have elbowed their way into um, a conversation, you know, a, a, a really brilliant solution to being part of a, a planned development. So that's a different approach again, working where development is already planned by another player, whether that's a local authority or a, a major developer. Um, and they, they've come up with a really wonderful um, sort of solution for themselves there. So loads of really useful contributions to the conversation um, throughout the day. This morning, we're going to hear from Andrew at Calder Vale and hopefully Charles will be able to join us from the Loon Valley Community Land Trust. Unfortunately, he is having technical difficulties this morning. So we'll, we'll, we'll all just have to bear with um, the situation and take it very much as it comes. But we can, we can make this a useful time for all of us um, regardless uh, of the technology. Um, um, so just a few more words from me about community-led housing and what the hub does uh, before I hand over to Andrew. Um, I just wanted to be really clear that our understanding of community-led housing includes the elements that um, it is, uh, it's about housing um, and sometimes other assets, but it's about buildings which are built or reclaimed by the local community. Um, it must be supported by the local community. So that means that involves genuine and sometimes really difficult conversation um, to encourage people to think about what they need and what they want and what can be done in their communities. Um, ultimately, it must be owned or managed by the community and it must be protected legally um, so that the benefit to the community can't be lost. Um, so that, that, that's really, really important ingredient because quite a lot of um, uh, that, that there's been quite a lot of concern that um, all this investment and all this time and energy goes into things which can ultimately be lost. Um, and that's that's obviously something we, we're really keen to avoid. So those are the four key elements of community led housing. It can come in a million different forms. Nobody goes the same way about it. Um, and there are lots of different solutions to all of the, 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 um, the, the issues that people identify locally. Part of my role and part of the, 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 the job of lots of other people across the country trying to support communities it, um, is to make sure that you know that, that communities are aware of who they need to be working with and talking to and making sure that they have good information and good professional advice available to them. You need a huge number of people chipping into your conversation if you plan to um, build or reclaim houses um, for, for, for local use. And um, part of our um, part of our role is to make sure that people find, can find the right people who've got the right expertise to help. Another important part of what we do is get people talking to each other, and that's partly what this is about today. Um, and also, we we run monthly catch ups for our local groups, so uh, people who are working in Cumbria, Lancaster area get together by Zoom and um, sort of compare notes and, and chivvy each other along and, and make sure that they're not missing something. Um, and it's, it's really supportive and encouraging, but important that people feel like they're part of something um, that, that's, you know, that, that's got potential beyond what they're doing in their very local conversations. Um, so um, all of this 
is, is about learning from others and borrowing good ideas and making sure that we share what we know. And in that spirit, um, thinking specifically about routes to communities providing affordable homes. Um, Andrew, I'm gonna hand over to you um, and you can tell us what's been going on in your area. The wonders of Zoom mean that we've got the ability to call on people from all over the, the UK um, and the world indeed, but I haven't invited internationally today. Um, uh, but but um, uh, I think we, we really like to see what's going on in our own areas but we we, sh we must keep looking out to to the experience of others and and um, seeing what's going on across across other areas. And really pleased to have you with us, Andrew. Um, I don't know if you want to say a few words before you bring your slides up. Um, um, yes, sure. Well, thank you very much, Fran, for the for the invitation. Um, and I think in, in some ways it's very appropriate for for us to participate today because when we started. Um, we went to a number of other uh, CLTs and community housing groups, and one of the groups who were particularly welcoming and particularly helpful were, was actually the Keswick Community Housing Trust. So, we, so we've we've learnt a lot. Um, I think that the CLT movement at the moment, the community-led housing movement, has a lot of energy around it, and there's an awful awful lot too of of, of sharing of ideas and and experiences, and I think that's that's all for the good. So let me try and see if I can get my slides up. Let's see how we get on. Okay. That's looking good. Uh, fine. I bet I think probably the first thing I want to do is tell you where the Calder Valley is for people who don't know. Now, has my slide changed? Yes, it yes. has. Good. Fine. Um, we're in the Pennines. We're in West Yorkshire, um, halfway between Leeds and Manchester. There's the town of Todmorden. Um, there's the town of Hebden Bridge with a very distinctive housing going up the hillsides. Um, there is a view of the River Calder not quite behaving itself. That was um, December 2015, just after the bad floods that Cumbria had too. We had uh, on Boxing Day 2015, we had very bad floods. So the town, the towns in the valley have had to pick up the pieces and the community has had to work together to try and um, repair the damage. And then finally, if you think our landscape looks a little bit familiar, um, one of my colleagues, one of my fellow trustees dug out that um, slide. If you've seen Happy Valley or if you've seen Last Tango in Halifax or if you've seen Gentleman Jack, you may well be familiar with our, with our landscapes. So um, we are, we're resolutely bottom up. We're trying as a community uh, to do something locally to um to meet the problems we have the, the housing crisis that we have we have a housing crisis the whole country has a housing crisis um and our story begins back in about 2013 2014 when when our local plan was being discussed by our council and there began to be a discussion among community groups about how we could ensure that, that at least some of the new homes that, which were going to be coming to to our valley were homes that met local needs and um, weren't just um, being imposed on us by external developers. So our focus is on bottom up community led affordable housing for rent. But we also have a secondary role, which is to hold land and buildings on behalf of the community. And I'll explain a little bit about that later on. So uh, we are a community benefit society. Uh, which is one of one of the the ways that uh, CLTs can become incorporated. Um, we are charitable, um, and to be honest, I don't see any reason for CLTs not wanting to become charitable. It gives quite a lot of benefits, uh, and it's it's not difficult. Um, somewhat unusually, we are also a registered provider of social housing. So in terms of regulation, we are almost treated like a very 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 small housing association. And again, I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, we are member controlled. Um, the, 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 the sovereign body, as it were, is the, the, the membership in general meeting. And we have now 250 people, primarily local people, who've chosen to become members of the CLT. And we, we are, at the moment, entirely volunteer run. Um, although just at the moment, we are also advertising for our first member of staff, closing date in two weeks' time. So our fingers are crossed that we, uh, we, we get we get uh, somebody good coming through and that will be a, a moment of change for our organization so let me tell you about our first development here's a, 
<laughs> here's a picture which I think was probably taken for the benefit of the local press. Actually, that's Simon on the left, with um, who's, who's, who's the chair of RCLT. And if you look behind Simon, you can see there's a board saying two local charities working together. This was a partnership we did with a very small almshouse trust um, in Todmorden. And the person on the right is actually their chair. But the main reason for showing you that picture is so you can see the land behind. This was the land which was gifted to us by our council, by Calderdale Council. And I think there are people here today from local authorities. And I, I do say that uh, I do have to say that I think our relationship with Calderdale is an extremely strong one. Uh, it's great that the council understands what we're trying to do and have been very supportive and very helpful. We couldn't really have asked for a better relationship with our local authority. Um, this was land which was um, which, which had been just left uh, fallow um, and it was land which we used to create six independent living bungalows, bungalows for local people in old older age. It was a bill that um, cost us £900,000 and because of the deal we did with the Arms House Trust um, they paid a third of the cost and we paid two thirds and they ended up with two of the bungalows. Um, bill began March 2019, and this is what it looked like when it was finished. So there you go, there are, there are the bungalows. Um, completed February last year, February 2020. Tenants moved in in March 2020. If you think back a year, 15 months, you'll realise that we got our tenants in a week before the first lockdown. So that was um, pretty close. But anyway, they're, they're now being lived in, and you can't take that picture today because you'd see flowers outside the bungalows, you'd see curtains in the windows, you'd see people around and, and so on. Um, I, I'm happy to talk later on if you want about the lessons we learned during the capital build. It should have been a relatively straightforward build, um, but I think capital builds never are completely straightforward. Um, we, we hit problems um, in terms of the groundwork. There were, there were massive boulders under the land, which the, um, the surveys we'd done hadn't picked up. I think they were probably brought by glaciers and, and dumped on that field. So um, so we, we had to cope with that. We had we had a contingency and, and so on. But let's say we can we can talk about the the practical experience of, of, a, of a new build, if, if you like, later on. Um, £900,000. It was put together partly through the contribution from the Arms House Trust. That's called John Eastwood. That's the 293000 You can see the sort of the pink bottom right. But we also had a grant from Homes England. Um, and our relationship with Homes England has also been a very strong one. Homes England, let me remind you, is the agency which channels government funds into affordable housing. It um, funds uh, housing associations, but it also funds uh, CLTs and community-led housing groups who have become re registered providers. And you'll, I won't, won't sort of talk about that pie chart in detail, but you'll see that um, we also had a, a bank loan. We went to our banker, Unity, um, who uh, have effectively got a secured mortgage loan on, on the bungalows. But we also, um, as, a, as a locally based community trust or charitable trust we can also hold um, community buildings on behalf of the community and very early in our story we were gifted um, a rather fine community centre in Todmorden this was an old Victorian school which had been derelict and which had been brought back lovingly into life by very much by the efforts of, of two local people who, who were the owners and they chose to gift the community centre to, um, to the CLT um, and there you can see the uh, the hall being used. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I think it's some sort of um, fabric event or textile event. And then last year, we had the opportunity to acquire the whole of the site. You can see the top picture shows the, the, the red sort of oval is the field and hall, the community centre. And you'll see it was part of a, a larger block of buildings, including two residential buildings on either side, which was where the teachers lived, the schoolmaster and the, the teacher. And they came on the market. And we felt this was an opportunity we had to take to secure for the long term the, the whole site and the land. So we had to raise something around £400,000, uh, £390,000 to, to buy the two houses and then a little bit extra for refurb. 
We managed to get a grant from Homes England, but the bulk of the money we needed we got through community shares. Um, and community shares, as you may, may well know, um, are increasingly being used. They're being used for community shops. They're being used for community run pubs. They're being used for community energy schemes, um, but they're also being used increasingly for community led housing projects. And I think they're a great idea. Um, and as I say on the slide, they do represent in a very, <laughs> in a very literal sense, buy in from local people into what we're trying to do because people are putting their savings, their, their investments into the CLT. And we actually raised £220,000 from 119 individuals, mostly local people, but some people invested from further afield, which was great. We were able to top that up with another £50,000 from the, the there's, um, if you look into this, there's a, a thing called the Community Shares Booster Programme, um, which is run through Cooperatives UK, and we got £50,000 from the Booster Programme. A further investment, this, these are not donations, these are investments, these, these are interest-bearing investments. Um, we took in up to £20,000. We had one or two investors who, who very kindly invested the full amount. Um, we also had the minimum set at 250 and a lot of people invested 250 and that's great too. And our investors joined our other members as members of the CLT. 2% um, interest. Uh, some people said they didn't want any interest. Some people said they would accept 1% interest. Um, and we also had an arrangement, and actually it's something we learned from, from Keswick, who've done this too, Keswick Community Housing Trust, um, that you can invite people, if they wish, to make over their investment to the CLT in the event of their death. So rather than going to their estate, it becomes a charitable bequest. So uh, we found that a very positive experience. We, we're very positive about the whole idea of community shares, um, partly because it's a way of accessing what they call patient capital. Um, I think it makes projects viable, which couldn't necessarily be funded just by commercial funding, but just as important, almost as almost more important, it strengthens the CLT within our community. Um, as I say, it has that direct buy-in from people. It means more more local people become members. Um, and there you go. That, that was the share offer document that we we issued. Um, happy to talk further about community shares if that's of interest to people. Now, we, um, we focus on two communities, Tomberden and Hebden Bridge. Um, Hebden Bridge is, is, is quite different in, in lots of ways, and the housing needs different. Um, it's become quite a popular tourist destination, and you know you will know in Cumbria what that means. It means that house prices go up. Um, there's a, a shortage of housing, particularly for our younger people. A lot of people who've grown up in the town find they can't afford to to stay in the town when they when they make the you know make when they get their own houses. So we've been working on um, a project in in Hebden Bridge uh, again on land which was gifted to us from the council. Um, challenging site. It's a site which had previously a, a lot of dense uh, terraced housing. Um, the housing was pulled down in the 1960s in a slum clearance scheme and the land has been left fallow ever since then but it is like most 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 of hebden bridge it is on a hillside so we've got all the challenges of trying to bring housing back on a, a very steep site um, and we've worked on this for some time um, we've had lots of public consultations we took proposals to planning back in 2018 and we were turned down which was a bit of a blow because um, the council was fully backing this uh, the council officers were fully backing this um, but i think we got a little bit tied up in in party politics um, so the the councillors at planning decided on a majority vote that they, they weren't sure they they like what we're doing so we're we're still working on that um, uh, and we're now working in partnership with a, a local smallish housing association and the deal would be that we would each meet half the costs and we would each um, have half the properties. At least that's the deal we expect to do. Um, and we would also look to the Housing Association to manage our properties once they're built. So again, I can talk a little bit about our relationship with a local housing association, which again has been very positive. Well, I had to show you this picture. Um, <laughs> I talked about the fact that the CLT um, is able to hold 
community buildings, heritage buildings for the community. And uh, there's been a lot of concern in Hebden Bridge about the signal box, which is um, grade two listed, which has the original uh, 1890s signal frame. And we were approached and asked if the CLT would like to be the the holding body, the legal custodian for the box. And so we have been working with Network Rail on discussing a 25 year lease from them. Um, we have to ensure that there's a funding stream coming in to make sure that we aren't taking on a liability, that we are taking on a potential asset. So our business plan actually has the box as a, as a heritage centre, but also for quirky overnight accommodation. Um, we anticipate um, people who are interested in, in railways being uh, our prime source of, of a customer for that. Uh, it'll sleep too. You, I think you might get a wee bit of noise from passing trains, but we think it will be, um, yeah, uh, a, a quirky experience for those who, who want to come to Hebden Bridge and sleep in the signal box. Um, a wee bit about our governance. Um, I say we, we are volunteer run. We've gradually over the years built up what I think is quite a strong board of trustees. Um, and we're quite aware of our responsibilities. I think we're quite um, conscious of the need to be well governed. We're a charity, we're an incorporated body, we're an RP, registered provider. We're of course also landlord to our tenants. Um, very soon we'll be an employer. And of course we've got the obligations too to our funders, including those individual investors. And um, to become a a registered provider, you do need to demonstrate to the regulator that you are a well-governed uh, organisation and also um, sec secure in terms of your financial management. Any new CLT, any new community-led housing group um, will at some point in the development have to take a decision on whether or not to go the RP route. Um, if you're a registered provider, you can obtain the Homes England Grants Direct which means that you end up owning the homes that you're responsible for creating and becoming the landlord to your own tenants. Um, if you choose not to become an RP, and a lot of CLTs do, and that's absolutely fine too, uh, and Charles, who I hope will be joining us shortly, have, have, have chosen to partner with the Housing Association and not to become an RP. Um, if you don't become an RP, then it's effectively the Housing Association that you partner with who has the responsibility for the build, that gets the funding package together, that owns the buildings. It might be on a, a leasehold from the CLT, but effectively you are partnering with a housing association and helping them increase their stock. Um, we, uh, we thought we wanted to be an RP. We intend to be around for the longer term. We're not just doing one development. We are intending to do lots of developments. And we were concerned, something Fran, you said at the beginning about, about ensuring that the homes that we create with all this effort we're putting in stay within the community and don't don't get sort of siphoned off, don't get sold on. Um, so we wanted to have as much control as possible of, of, uh, of the homes that we were hoping to create. Um, but uh, becoming an RP does, does uh, impose obligations quite rightly, I think on organisations. Um, the regulator is concerned to ensure that social housing bodies, housing associations and CLTs are properly managed, that they look after their tenants, that um, they meet the prescribed standards. Um, we're conscious that the government is, is planning to tighten up on regulations for housing associations, so you know we will be caught under that. There are some exemptions for CLTs under uh, right to acquire uh, legislation, but nonetheless, there is a potential potential risk there. Um, so, so it's an issue that needs to be thought about carefully. And um, as as a CLT that's jumped through the hoops, we're having quite a lot of informal discussions with other CLTs that are just at the process of saying, well, we think we're going to go ahead too, and we try and share what expertise we've got from that process. So that is my presentation. Um, as I say, uh, it's been very much the community doing it for itself. I think that's the key message. And it's quite doable. You know, we're one of what, 300, 300 plus CLTs around the country now. Um, lots of different models, lots of people doing different things, but all of us, in a sense, demonstrating that community led housing can work, that it can be done. And I will stop sharing my screen there. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. That was great. Really, really helpful um, 
and such a lot of different things going on there, but really, really useful and um, great to see. Uh, great to see the railway um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> enthusiasts being catered for as well. Yes, <laughs> if anyone wants to come and stay, just let me know. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, it's, if I can just do a practical thing for a moment and check in with Becky about whether we are expecting Charles. It's not looking good. Um, okay. Backup plan is that if you share his slides, I'll try and talk through them. And I'm, I'm really glad that uh, Lucy is here as well, Lucy Chief and some from South Lakes Housing, because maybe the pair of us can do a bit of a, a double act on that. Um, okay, okay. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So perhaps before we get to that, we can um, do a few questions with Andrew if people have them. I, I, I picked up on a number of things that um, that really interested me. Um, uh, but I can see that Ruth's wanting to dive in. So if we go straight to Ruth and um, anybody else who wants to um, ask questions, please just stick your hand up um, or shout out if I can't see you. But Ruth, over to you. Thank you very much, Fran. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for that, Andrew. Really interesting. And I've a whole heap of questions, so I'll, I'll just sort of stick with a couple. Um, you described a lot of stuff that you did as a as a group, as a committee, and you said it's been led from the ground up from the community. How, how can communities that don't, because it seems to me that you've got a lot of capacity amongst your committee. So you have a lot of experience of different things. You know, you need to be expert at the planning system. You need to understand finance, all of these things. What about communities where they don't necessarily have that capacity? you know how can they go about developing a community-led housing solution yeah i mean that's a really good question uh, i mean i think we are quite rich where we are in terms of human capital mm. we're not necessarily affluent in a conventional sense um but there are a lot of people who are sort of stuck in and then there's a tradition too in in our valley of of people you know going back 100 years actually we had a very strong cooperative tradition here um there's a tradition of people sort of getting stuck in but you're right um uh, yes that's absolutely the case we we haven't done it entirely by volunteer efforts and we have um been quite proactive in looking around to try and strengthen our board so we haven't waited just for people to to come to us we've we've um we actually went through a sort of recruitment process a year or two back for new trustees we put a job advert you know pay is nil <laughs> lots of responsibilities but why not uh, why not um, apply and we got four new trustees that way which was really helpful um it would be wrong to say that we've done it entirely by volunteer effort we haven't we've we've been able to buy in support from um sort of consultancy support there's somebody based locally who's um who, who's their experience as a sort of um arts and housing consultant um, and we've been able to get funding to buy his time so that for the rp process the registered provider process which demands a lot of work a lot of financial documentation the business plan and so on mark was able to help us through that um actually we also had help from locality during that process too um there is there are parts of of my borough which which where i think it would be much harder to set up a clt because there isn't that that um groundswell of people wanting to get in and at that point maybe maybe um you, you look for more top-down solutions uh, i mean what we're doing is what local authorities traditionally have done yeah. and fantastic they have you know 1919 and the addison, addison act and all that you know for a long time Local authorities saw it as their responsibility to ensure that, as, that people in their in their areas had decent housing, and we've lost that in the last thirty years. And what we're doing in some ways is is picking up the pieces, um, perforce. I'm afraid. Thank, thanks, Andrew. That's really helpful. I think the thing of getting you know recruiting for the board is something maybe that other places could think about where they've less capacity. Can I just chuck in another question, Fran, before um, we go to someone else? I, I was just interested in what the biggest impact of these community-led schemes are in the communities that you described if you had to sort of distill it to a few yeah. key issues well yeah we've been working what for seven or eight years working really quite hard lots and lots of people putting a lot of time into this and we've ended up at the moment with six properties 
<laughs> so in quantitative terms, you could say that what we're doing is, is minuscule and, and doing almost nothing for the housing crisis. What I would like to think is that we are actually able to do something exemplary um, and also able to empower people to feel that the planning system isn't something that they have absolutely no control over, that the planning system is something that people can actually proactively engage with and not just negatively respond yeah. to people's ideas. So in that sense, I think there is value in community-led housing ventures. I'd like to think so anyway. Thanks. Sue, I can see you're waiting to speak. You're still on mute. Yeah. Um, it's really just to ask, is it the case that the houses that you um, provide are not are exempt from the right to buy? Because that's so important for people who are wanting to set up, you know, social housing. Yeah. Yes, they are. And they are exempt partly because they're specialist housing for older people. Um, we have a potential issue on right to acquire, not right to buy, but right to acquire uh, for the two residential properties we, we 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 bought recently on the other side of the community centre. Um, but that's a risk we felt we 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 would um, be able to cope with. Um, you do need to check that. Um, mm. CRT, CRTs are, are, this is confusing, there's a lot of good advice coming through from the National Network of CLTs and Tom Chance there um, is, is more knowledgeable than me, but my understanding is that the CLTs were actually exempt from, um, from the Housing Act 2015, elements of the Housing Act. So I, I think I'm not the right person to ask that question to. <laughs> So you were saying that if your housing hadn't been for older people, it might have been subject to something similar? Um, I think it might might have been subject to right to acquire. Yeah. Right. Thank you. This is one of the problems of becoming an RP and taking Homes England money. If you take Homes England money, you can fund things that you otherwise couldn't do, but there is the knock-on effect that you are liable for some of the housing legislation. But then on the other hand, if you partner with a housing association, they also have these obligations. So you don't get around it that way either. No, no, yeah. it's, it, it's, all, it's all very much tied up with where the money comes from, what your, what your obligations then become. Mm. But um, the community land trust approach does provide protection from uh, conventional right to buy. Um, uh, so it is accepted that these, these homes will be, um, yeah, exempt. Uh, and kept for the benefit of the community. Um, uh, that's great. I can see that Charles is trying to join. I'm not sure whether he has managed to. Um, he's the person who's just sne sneaked in with my name on his um, uh, screen. Um, Charles, can you hear us? It doesn't look as though you can at the moment. No, perhaps not. Um, I think Nicola had a question. Do you have any Hi, um, it was kind of answered there. I was just um, considering the, the specialist and supported and um, and housing and sort of what what sort of protections that gives really. I mean, if you, um, I don't know if you do things like social impact reporting um, and things like that. I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure about those sort of regulations. And my question was around that, if you've had any sort of inkling from Homes England as to how much protection you have currently. Because I know it's everything subject to change, obviously, but we just want as many protections as possible once you've put it in place. Yeah, we did a social impact report uh, last year, um, which, which is available on our website and also written into our annual accounts because we wanted our annual accounts to be a, a social report as well as a financial report. Um, there are various sort of matrices that the regulator of social housing requires you to, to undertake, as, as you may well know, um, and, and we, we, do, we do the sums for that. I mean, it's not, a, not an onerous task. The social impact of what we were keen to do to see whether we were making an, an impact in our communities. Um, we were quite heartened by what came back. Um, it's obviously easier to do financial accounts and as it were social or environmental accounts, but nonetheless, you're not just there for the finances, you're there for the social and environmental benefits. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's, that's what I was thinking. Obviously, you've got, you can generate more support yeah. and 
you know, investment in things if you can demonstrate just how valuable it is to the community and yeah. and let them know as well, you know, and especially when the members and things like that, I'm sure they were made up. So, yeah, yeah thank you. I'll, um, I'll put our web address on the chat. And if you go to the, the, the first page, which is who we are, you can, there's a link there to the social impact report. Perfect, so, thank you. Interested. Brilliant. OK, um, I, I've got a, a, a sneaky question before we move on, um, if, if that's all right, Andrew. Um, I'm, you mentioned um, credibility as a, a, a feature which you um, which you build with um, the status of registered provider. Um, and I just wondered how um, what your approach was to building credibility with the local authority, because they clearly have been a very solid partner with you and um the gifting of land is um it's not unheard of but it's not common practice these days so um i i just wondered whether there was anything you could offer in terms of how to build the confidence of the local authorities we're working with that this is a safe pair of hands and you know how, how did you go about that conversation in the first instance um, okay, well, we had a really useful and positive meeting with the, the relevant director of the local authority, director of economy and regeneration back in 2013, 14. Um, we, we had, a, as individuals, we had something of a track record. Some of us had been involved in a, an asset transfer of Hebden Ridge Town Hall, um, which also had raised something, something like three million, quite a large chunk of ERDF money to, for a new build. So we, we had demonstrated that as individuals we had some track record um maybe we were lucky uh, uh, we've also got a very supportive um housing team in the council but they understood they understood what a, a clt could do uh, i know not every clt has that good relationship but i think you just have to try and work on it and we've also found ourselves with a very good relationship with homes england again we went out of our way to to meet the the officers there and to invite them across uh, it's just a question really of opening that dialogue saying who you are and what you're trying to achieve um and um but having said that we also work very closely on partnerships with other community organizations um so there are three or four really key partnerships we've got locally that we we um we feel help help us do our job better and hopefully help them too that's really helpful and i, and I think that's exactly right that that sense of um almost that feeling of success breeding success but it's um it's important to get the first step along that road isn't it and to yes. to have um, have the credibility and the, and the confidence to kind of move the conversation forward and i mean it's quite funny step. since we became an rp we've been invited to the quarterly, me quarterly meetings um which the council organizes with all the housing associations locally so we sit around the table you know there we are our little clt we sit around the table with some of the largest housing associations in the country who also operating Calderdale um, and um, and I think that credibility has been helpful it's meant that for example the council's just recently started talking to us about some empty properties there and which we feel we can bring back into into uh, occupancy so in all sorts of ways it's helped strengthen our work great Oops, sorry I've got my buttons in a model there um, I think you can hear me now <laughs> um, Thank you very, very much, Andrew. If anybody has any other questions that, that sort of pop into their brains, then do just use the chat function um, while we move the conversation along. I think Charles is with us and can hear us. I'm not absolutely sure about that. Hello, Charles. Are you there? You'll need to unmute yourself if you can hear me. Not convinced he is. I can see a picture of a, a phone with a cross through it, so I, I think it's hung up or not a lost connection. Um, Okay. We start and maybe he shall can. I, shall I get the slides us? up and then we can take it from there? Um, okay, I'll keep an eye out for Charles and just see if he, he can join us. Um, hmm. So, yeah, so I'm Becky Winter, I work at Lancaster City Council as their community um, housing officer, and I'm speaking on behalf of Charles Anger, the chair of the Loon Valley Community Land Trust. Um, and the scheme here in, in Halton uh, is in partnership with South Lakes Housing. So I, I'll be hoping Lucy will chip in and help where needed. Um, next slide, please, Fran. Can you see the slides? Because I can't. I can. 
<laughs> I'll just see what I can do. Um, uh, this is not working for me. Um, my screen's just showing me your faces and um, Sorry, one second. Mm -hmm. So just a bit of background about, about this. <coughs> this the, um, you can see okay. <laughs> um, so in Holton, um, several years ago, the, the Lancaster co-housing group formed and, and built, I think, 40 passive house homes there and, and, and built a community there. And they, uh, they wanted to do more. And that's why Charles, a resident of Lancaster co-housing and, and Chris ain't, Chris, Co Chris Andrew, Chris Coates, who's speaking in the next session, have started two separate organisations, and they were very lucky to find um, a piece of land, a stone's throw from where they live, um, which a, a developer, I believe, hadn't quite completed their um, their development there and hadn't finished the affordable housing unit on that site. Um, so they were able to, with help from Lancaster City Council, purchase that land um, from the community housing fund. Um, and then work with South Lakes Housing to, to develop homes. So this particular scheme is, is 20 affordable passive house homes. And I'll carry on when I get guided through the slides. Are you still seeing the first slide, Becky? Yeah. I'm really sorry. Um, sometimes if you go back to the, the sort of the openings shot, you, we can see the slides on the left. That some, sometimes can work. I've had this problem with the, the opening slide freezing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I can see a toolbar, but it looks empty. Mm. Right, I might just close everything. Yeah. And if you stop just sharing stop. and try again, that would be the way to go. Uh, the trouble is. The trouble appears to be. Um, just Fran, does Becky have the slides? Because you can co host with her and let her show them. I don't think so. Charles, are you with us? Right, that looked, that, that looked promising for a second. It, okay, let me try again. Um, so Charles is saying he's in, but he, and he can see everything, but he can't speak at the moment. He's trying to make that work. He could, oh, he's, he could type in the chat, probably. Right, that looks promising. What are you seeing now? Slide two, slide one, slide two. You just toggle okay. between them. Okay. I, in that case, I, I might just try doing slideshow, but I might just toggle. If you can see enough. Yeah. It's cut <laughs> off a little enough? bit because of the toolbar. Mm. So the toolbar is cutting it off. I'd suggest going for slideshow and it's probably be okay. It doesn't seem to want to do that. Uh, let's have a look. There you go. There's a, yeah, there's a little toolbar. There's a little toolbar that comes up when you uh, press press that again. Yeah, okay. resume, slide resume show, slideshow. Slideshow, resume slideshow. There we go. Not happening. If if you just click on the left hand side on the third slide, that should work. From there we go. Yep. So I can move the slides along. Can you see enough of the yeah. slides? Yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Apologies. <clears throat> We're getting there. <laughs> no worries. What was the second slide? I missed the second slide. There we go. The second slide. All oh, right. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the reasons why they set up the Loon Valley Community Land Trust, um, as you can see there, Holton is a, is a village three miles east of Lancaster. There are four large commercial housing developments in the last 10 years. Um, much of that has been poor quality, too small, too few new affordable homes. Um, and developers not responsive to, to arguments. Um, so they formed the Loon Valley Community Land Trust in February 20, 
18 to build good homes and partly to show how it could be and should be done. Um, okay, next slide. So these are some of the, 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 the sort of um, main focuses of what they wanted to achieve. Um, obviously, affordable housing for local people. Um, we have already gone through a, um, an allocations policy with, with South Lakes Housing and ourselves at the council and, and Loon Valley to make sure that the people who live in the Holton village and the surrounding villages are prioritised. Um, they're going to be high quality, as I've mentioned before, they're going to be passive house standard and they're also going to exceed national space standards by 5%. Um, the community focused design, they will be car parking on the edges so that between the houses down the centre, um, you know, people can mix and gather and children can play without worrying about cars driving in. Um, so pedestrian central street and communal spaces, there will be communal garden spaces, which hopefully the community who live here will take responsibility for and and share looking after that and, and growing things. Um, it was a brownfield site, uh, redeveloped derelict land, avoids building on green land, so it was a good suitable site for development. Um, they're promoting sustainable transport, there'll be uh, electric vehicle point charging um, systems in place and there's public transport, good cycling networks, um, walking will be encouraged and they'll hopefully start a car club which is what they do at Lancaster co-housing. And, and using local renewable energy, I'm, I'm, can, anyone can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I believe this site it will be all uh, there'll be no gas on the site, and the electric for the for the site will all come from uh, a mix of the hydro plant and um, solar panels, and the, the, basically the energy is coming from the site. They they won't need to be it'll be carbon neutral. They won't need to bring a great deal in, if any. Um, and yes, it's partnered with like South Lakes Housing and strongly supported by Lancaster City Council. Next slide, please, Fran. Community-led housing, what is the difference? Uh, it serves local people's needs. They did a survey and build sizes are mixed to fit the results of that survey. So they, you know, they're not doing what they think is, is best on the site. They're doing what they know meets the needs of the local community. Um, and the community is um, helping the design. I personally went to one of their um, events where they had um, two or three, I think it was, different designs of houses, how the houses might look, and people were invited to give their views and vote on which, which design they preferred. Um, and the residents remain involved, so they will help manage the site and they can take part in decisions um, and be become part of the Community Land Trust. Um, I know there's a good, there's a strong intention there for the residents to form a group that can self-manage things like the community gardens and, and make decisions for themselves as an individual community. Um, and there'll be a lot of effort put in once we know who's going to be living in the homes to make sure that they can, can be part of the process of finishing the homes as much as possible. It's all going to depend on how soon we can, we can um, have, you know, we can know who's going to be in the houses. Um, and affordable in perpetuity. So they will they won't be subject to right to buy um, if they're renting. And if people are in shared ownership homes and they want to staircase to 100%, South Lakes Housing will buy back the property from them. They'll be first, um, they have to have first right of offer. And then they will resell it at a shared ownership rate. So they will stay affordable in perpetuity. Thanks, Fran. So the sustainability um, in aspects, uh, passive house, so very low energy consumption. And what we're realizing as well in terms of passive houses is a strong move towards making sure people know how to live in passive house. And that's something that the council is supporting at the moment and will be supporting through this scheme um, because it's a different way of living and people need to know um, what, you know, what it, what you do. You can't, apparently, according to someone I know who lives in the Lancaster co-housing, it's not a case of just flicking the heating on and your house warms up in five minutes. It's a, it's a system that needs time and understanding. So there'll be a lot of effort put into making sure people know how to live in a passive house. Um, that passive house homes should reduce utility consumption by about, um, down to about 10%. It should be 10% of what the average home uses. So that would reduce um, chances of fuel poverty um, and obviously give people more expendable income. Um, uh, the space standards exceed national standards by 5%, um, and the air is healthier in passive house homes, so people are less likely to, um, you know, children less likely to get asthma and, and other respiratory issues, but also people with those issues will breathe better air and, and hopefully live more comfortably. Um, renewable energy, so they should be connected to the local hydro plant and solar panels. And, and yeah, encouraging um, sustainability by walking, cycling, car clubs. 
Yep. So this is some slightly more technical information about Passive House. Um, as I say, in terms of the comfort, it, you know, it, it, it creates a, a healthier environment for people to live in, better, air, cleaner air to breathe, um, and obviously significantly reduced energy. So helping us to combat the effects of climate change. Um, I'm sure if Charles joined us, he can answer any technical questions on Passive House, but um, yeah, it's obviously a great aspiration to try and achieve. Uh, next slide, please, Bran. Uh, yeah, I'll let people peruse that slide. <laughs> um, and passive houses. Oh, thanks, Bran. <laughs> I think the thing to know about passive house as well that I've come to learn is, is um, it's it's getting more affordable. Um, Charles has given me the figures for the build cost of, of these homes and is, is, is expected to be around um, 1,500 per square meter, somewhere between 1,500 square meters to, to 1,600. And I, I believe that when they made the passive house homes at Lancaster co-housing, you know, it would have been more than that. So we are looking year on year at this becoming more affordable and with the with the changes in legislation to to make developers, you know, have to create more sustainable homes. It will hopefully just get more affordable and more the norm as, as time moves on. Um, I think there's been a lot of concern amongst developers that they can't achieve this because it's not affordable. But this this case, this this scheme is proving that it can be done. Um, it's passive house is better because of fabric first design principle, but also due to material spec and site testing and inspection. Energy savings are very high and performance is reliable. Okay, thanks, Fran. Yeah, there's examples of all the different organizations that are, are doing passive house now. So it is becoming much more the norm. And um you know, when we know we can make homes like this, when it's when we're capable of making homes like this that that lower utility bills and create healthier air, it, it should be the norm. It shouldn't just be a an aspiration of of people who are eco warriors. It should just be what we are doing as standard, and and slowly we're moving in that direction, which is great. But faster would be better. <laughs> Building for the twenty first century. So people, very low heating bills, avoiding fuel poverty, great health, no dampness, um, better for the planet. And for the provider, well-built homes, happier families, um, take care and stay longer, minimise rent arrears, tenant voids, hassles and costs. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the people that are living in these homes will experience a better quality of life. Um, I've certainly lived in houses with damp and with drafts and... And I'm well aware, having worked with them um, with homeless people for much of my history, that it's it's a, it's a common theme that people are living in poor poor quality housing, and it's it's not necessary, and it shouldn't be the case. And this this scheme proves that we can provide affordable home, which is good quality and safe and and great for the environment. Um, designed for the community. So yeah, twenty new affordable homes. A mixture of uh, one bed flats and two and three and four bed houses, Th excuse me, 13 are for rent and seven for shared ownership. Um, that kind of calculation is based on um, Homes England funding. So Homes England funding, they do stipulate what sort of mix of, um, of tenure that they would expect. And they'll say a certain percentage of shared ownership to rental. So, so if you take Homes England funding, you can't just decide to do 100% rent or 100% shared ownership because they do have, they have a voice in what that will look like. And coming soon is First Homes, which is um, a scheme for first time buyers, which will be a discounted market rate. So future schemes might see more discount market rate for first time buyers. Um, there's a, a shared communal space and pedestrian and private gardens. So you can see from the, from the images there that the center line is all communal space where children can play and people can mix and hopefully create a nice friendly neighborhood environment. Um, there's a mature tree belt for wildlife. And so the trees that exist there now um, I think they'll be enhanced as well with extra trees and growing spaces um, and we'll be encouraging the residents to play a community role and I think both the Loon Valley Community Land Trust and ourselves at the council and South Lakes Housing will all join in in that effort to try and make sure that the people who are moving into these homes form a community and, and, and work together to, to look after their homes and their land and, and be a support to each other. 
And yeah, we'll try and do that through drop in sessions with the residents to explore what can what potential there can be. Thanks, Ran. Um, delivering the project. Oh. <laughs> Down again, thank you. So yeah, it's a it's partnership and collaboration. Um, Bloom Valley Community Land Trust own the, own the land and they have a legal lease with South Lakes Housing who have acquired the funding to develop it. So some of the funding is from themselves and some from Homes England. Um, so they've taken on the bulk of the, um, well, the, the main bulk of the financial um, pressure at the South, so South Lakes Housing. John Gilbert Architects were appointed to, to design the project. Um, I don't know what Elliot and Co and Parkins have done. Maybe Lucy knows. So yeah, Elliot's. Hi everybody. Elliot's are our employees agent, and RG Parkins are our engineer. And again, we're chosen to work along, alongside John Gilbert with um, obviously very vested interest in passive house and kind of the whole greening agenda as well. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, Tyson Construction will be doing the build. Um, the planning decision was made at the the end of last year. Um, and the construction is, what, what are we actually at? The land's been cleared. Are they, are they actual diggers on site now? Yes, excavation yes, yeah. taking place, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was, because when Charles was speaking the other day, I could hear noise in the background. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there's, it's, it's, it's starting now, which yeah. is super exciting. And there's a plan, there's expect, expectation that people would move in in the autumn of next year. Um, so in terms of funding and grants, Lancaster City Council provided the funding for the purchase of the land and the pre-development costs. Um, right through from the housing needs survey to the viability studies, um, that kind of thing, and South Lakes are funding the construction alongside a Homes England grant. Why go for a housing association of partnership? So, as Andrew explained, that they you know, the reason why they chose what they did. Um, this, these are the reasons why um, Charles and, and the Loon Valley Community Land Trust. Um, went with South Lakes Housing and I think they were quite fortunate in that that South Lakes Housing was very much in line with the the aims and objectives and the ethos that they had it's not always been easy for land trusts to find a housing association that that matches what they're trying to achieve um so with, with South Lakes Housing I think it was, a, it was a, a partnership that was very much in harmony from the beginning so that, that was fortunate um so the choice is obviously you could do it yourself um own mortgage loan and grant funding take all the risks and hire and contract for the roles we need to deliver the scheme, manage the homes. Um, I'll, I'll let you read that yourselves. It's um, those are the choices that they had, and ultimately they chose a development lease partnership because um, they had limited time and energy to apply, and we wanted to use the housing association's detailed skills. Um, to use the housing association's larger, cheaper financial resources to put in more capital than we had, um, so that we needed less grant subsidy, making it all more financially viable. Um, to avoid Loon Valley Community Land Trust having to become a registered provider, it, it is a big, a big thing to undertake. Um, we wanted to persuade other housing associations to adopt our approach and sustainability quality vision. So this is also a demo project. And I think that's that's a really, really good point. It's, you know, if you work with a, a housing association that shares your vision, um, then it has, you know, impacts on what they might want to achieve outside of this scheme. It's a, it's, it's a benefit to both and it will hopefully influence the wider sector. Um, timeline and key stages. So they started off with their vision and site feasibility study and then onto the design team and planning permission, Det more detailed design and construction and occupation. Um, and there you've got the housing association partnership and the funding details uh, right through to the community land trust purchase the land value blah, blah, blah. the um land was purchased well the option agreement came in in october 2019 and they bought the land very recently in march 2021 so once you buy the land the actual time it, you had then have in order to start on site is pretty quick it's all the things that come before that that take quite a lot of time. Thanks, Fran. Our key lessons in a partnership with a housing association. Uh, look for a partner with shared interests. We found that South Lakes Housing wanted to move in our direction geographically and also in terms of environment and quality. Um, we gave them a project and a vision and a site to do it. So it was mutually beneficial. Um, work early together, get to know and trust each other. 
while the legal lease stuff goes on in the background. Agree the hard bits of the lease. Agreeing the hard bits of the lease was the biggest test of our relationship. <laughs> um, the innovative 150 year lease gives us some control and a continuing influence on the key community led housing goals, affordability and perpetuity, tenure types and locals priority, planning conditions, um, building quality and energy standards, empowerment of residents, and critically, it is still lendable against for SLH. Do you want to touch on what that means, Lucy? Sorry, struggling to find the unmute. Yeah, it just means that we um, can then borrow against the scheme in the future to be able to continue to build for more affordable homes. Um, so it's obviously very important to us that we can continue to borrow against our new developments. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we can send out slides, no problem. Um, the local interest and agreement, our involvement in community publicity and consultation over three years led to no local objections at planning and effective early marketing. And we already have more applicants for the homes um, that we're providing. Thanks, Luz. Uh, Fran? Summary of lessons so far, um, energy and poverty. Make homes easy and cheap to run, zero carbon and very low energy cost. Building to a passive house standard is a win-win-win for people, planet and management. <laughs> Design for community, involve the local community, build what they need um, and plan schemes as a community, not suburbs, enabling as much sharing as possible for sustainability. Um, collaborate and partner to deliver to suit your context and circumstances, members interest in energy and finances, local council support can be critical. Every community can do this and, and find a way that fits. And thanks for listening. And I would just add that to the end of that, that this, this particular scheme has what's inspired me to start my um, community land trust in Kensal where I live because um, they've just shown how I wouldn't say how easy it is to do it, but how it is anyone could do it. If there's if there's enough buy-in in the local community um, and there's a need in the local community, it can be done. And um, even though quite fortunate in Kendall that South Lakes, not South Lakes, yeah, South Lake and District Council still has quite a bit of money in the community housing fund. So we do, we are at an advantage. Um, but I just think I was utterly inspired by what, the, what they've achieved here. And uh, and this is what's great about community-led housing, because the more you learn, the more you get inspired to do to do your own thing. Thanks, Fran. Right, I'm going to unshare, and Charles has raised his hand, so I'm hoping that he might be able to join in. So just bear with me a moment. Charles, are you able to join us for speaking purposes? <laughs> I can't see that you're muted at the moment, but we can't hear you. And could Charles put his comments in the chat and everybody can see them there? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm afraid, Charles, that might be the best bet for you. If you've got something you want to add, we're very grateful for your slides. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, Becky, for holding the, th the thought. Um, and Charles, if there are things you want to specifically add right now, please do add them in the chat and we'll make the best of your contributions. Um, and um, I'm, I will open up to... Um, conversation questions. I can see that Andrew's put a, a question in the chat. Um, shall we just open up I, and see how we get on? Charles, yeah, last fine. chance. Charles, can you hear us? Can you speak to us? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Apologies. We'll just have to take your comments in the chat, which hopefully you can contribute to. Okay. Um, Andrew, did you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I think this is really inspiring, actually, and I think I want to get Charles down to the Calder Valley sometime soon for a public meeting because we, we need to learn from 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 the expertise going on there. But my question really was was how um, did the CLT fund the land? Uh, where did the funding come from to en enable mm. the purchase? So that, that came from the Community Housing Fund. So Lancaster got uh, 707,000. Um, and well, actually, I think the land purchase itself may have come from commuted sums, um, of which we would have got some, I believe, because of this particular piece of land, because the developer hadn't completed on their 106 um, agreement. So there was some, some sums coming from that. But um, 
yeah, so there was a mixture of pre-development costs that came from the community ha ha housing fund, and then the land cost, I think, came from commuted sums. So I think, I mean, that that is a factor in the fact that this, this scheme can go above and beyond, you know, all the things that they're achieving, passive house, exceeding space standards, etc. Um, that has obviously been helped by the fact that the initial costs were covered. Um, so, you know, if you're doing a scheme from the get go, then and land costs and pre-development costs need to be need to be factored in, then it's going to be more difficult to achieve those kind of standards. Um, and it may be that in those cases, CLTs have to go for a mixture of market rates as well as affordable. I think on this as well, if I can just add in, sorry, uh, we had an en enhanced level of Homes England grant due to the, the specification of the properties being passive house. So that's obviously really helped towards bridging that gap as well um, and making the scheme viable. But as Becky just said, yeah, well, obviously we've got a high, higher percentage of affordable rent compared to the shared ownership. And if there was some of the, the, you know, the new homes um, or outright sale, which could help prop, any, prop up a passive house sort of development that would obviously help in the long run as well. And Charles has just added as well that um, the grant funding of upfront costs, I think it means de-risk de -risk the partnership yeah. of both parties and made it, made it easy to innovate. Uh, brilliant. I, I have one comment. It's not, not so much a question, um, but um, I was just uh, really impressed by the note that um, there were no objections to this planning application when it went in. I think that's such a, a vital indicator of um, community support and the conversation, all of the work that goes into the conversations before you get to that stage so that the community isn't taken by surprise, the community knows what it's getting, the community wants what it's getting and is behind you all the way. I think that's brilliant. And I think that's one of the key um, aspects of community-led um, housing conversations. Um, I, I, I am curious about um, the, 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 the sort of affordability, affordability ratios in this part of the country and um, uh, wondering what the general perception um, would be about bog standard affordable homes. Um, I noticed that the presentation started with the, the comments about there have already been four large scale developments and presumably those didn't go through unchallenged by the community. It is a, a different way of starting the conversation and giving people what they want. And also interesting to think about whether people are motivated by that energy efficiency conversation as well, that the, the building to a better standard, uh, people understanding that better and um, literally buying into um, you know, looking to the future rather than just solving the problem now, which I think is where we get a bit stuck in some of our larger scale developments. So that's just a comment, but if, um, mm. if any, yeah. I think the sustainability element of it is increasingly more important to people. And I think COVID has had a big impact on that as well. People are realizing that their home, when they're having to use more energy in their home because they're in it all the time, they're realizing how energy efficient their homes are. I mean, we, we in Kendall have done a, a survey recently and and it was pretty much everyone five was um, extremely supportive of, of a, a sustainable home. Um, so that there's definitely much more, um, yeah, uh, strength in, in providing that now. People want that now. Brilliant. Anybody else got any questions on this? And it is a bit difficult without being able to hear you, Charles. But thank you very much for chipping into the um, chat. We can see that you've made some comments about um, community consultation and um, the fuel poverty benefit, which I think, uh, you know, is very live. Um, lots of people um, um, mu much more conscious of that uh, now than they've ever been before. And also, um, you know, however you look at it, things generally not moving in a, in a good direction. Um, for lots of people being able to stay comfortable in their homes. So if we solve those problems by design um, rather than uh, after the fact, it makes it a huge difference. Um, right, anyone else got their hand up to speak at the moment? Anybody wanting to chip in? Okay, that's kind too, Charles, thank you. Um, We'll, your email address was on the end of the slides, so when we circulate the slides, people can get in touch with you directly. That's a very generous offer. Thank you. Um, okay, well, um, it's quarter to 11. We ha um, we, we've got... <laughs> Does anyone feel inspired to have a go um, is, is the next question. Come on then, anybody feeling inspired to have a go? <laughs> um, 
uh, we've got 15 minutes left uh, if, if we need them. Um, and uh, really, I, I just wanted to summarize the, the, the main things that have come through and, uh, and really to back both Andrew and Charles in their, um, their assertion that, that, that this is doable, you know, that, that communities are making this happen. And that that's it, it, it's still very humbling to watch it happen. And uh, you know we're we're still very impressed by those who are making it happen. But it's um, it's great to see that there are more people um, having a go, and um, that, that there are different routes through. We've heard from two very different routes in terms of um, how much control and how much capacity the groups have to take that control. It, um, and really useful to know that there are. Um, uh, um, different ways of achieving the same affordable housing end result for our local communities um, and meeting the local need, whether that's for homes to buy or homes to rent. Um, and, uh, so there's a comment from Margaret. Do you want to do you want to speak, Margaret? <coughs> Hi, good morning. Um, I was uh, I was only intending to watch and not really get too involved, but I've been so inspired. Um, but I'm I'm really just matching people together to form friendly house shares. It's for people over 40. It's really to combat loneliness and isolation. And um, I started building a Facebook group and I've got over 500 people now who are looking to um, to get together to form friendly house shares. And what I do is I match people together by location, budget and lifestyle, but I'm finding it so hard to find landlords and properties. You know, that's the stumbling block. Um, lots of properties are HMOs, they're for millennials, they're for students, but um, finding properties for people over 40 is, is so difficult. And so this might be a way forward but it's 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 not it's completely it's not really my expertise. It's not where I envisioned going. But it seems like you know that might be the way forward. Where, where, are, you, where are you based, Barbara? Well, I'm in London. Okay. Um, but the people in my group are from all over the UK. I think it'd be really interesting to consider the community loan share element because the um, there's a there's an organisation. Um, in Brighton called Sea Salt, which is a it's a student co-op, but their their first house, which I think was worth three hundred and something thousand, was bought through community loan shares, and the, the Brighton CLT um, organised that. Um, and because you know, I think the the investors there they got a quite higher percent, more like five or six percent, I believe, and it is an investment. Um, so people are, are buying into property, which you know not always ideal because we what a lot of the community-led housing movement is trying to do is take away the the idea of our property as as um, you know a financial benefit but having said that if you were to be able to get your a first property bought then then mm -hmm. build from that and then create more and more and more on the same model um rather than trying to find landlords and then be them to them if you could create a movement where you you know you own the homes and people buy into that concept um that's one way of looking at it, one way of going. Okay. Really All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Um, Michael, I can see you have your hand yeah. up. Yeah, it was just, just, it's just kind of an observation, really, because I did, I did, I did set up the um, North Lancashire Community Land Trust a, a, several years ago, or, or at least was it involved in initially setting it up. So this has been a, this has been a subject that's been close to my heart for a very long time, but. It's just the context is very interesting. I just find the context interesting because the more I look into big house builders and what they're doing, the more I the more I despair about the future quality and suitability and even of, of, of all the housing stock that's going up at the moment. So it's just it's just that what we're, what everybody's collectively doing is is absolutely critical in getting a getting at any purchase on, uh, on on decent community housing in the future, because I don't actually see it coming from mainstream housing builders at all at the moment. No, so that's interesting. Just, just an observation. 
um, obviously um, uh, environmental standards are being pushed upwards, but um, probably not fast enough. And there, there, there's a worry that um, things will fray at the edges. So it's, um, uh, I think, uh, um, really brilliant that um, Charles's project, um, as described, pushes a, a, a respected housing association to, to think differently and creates an example which can be used elsewhere as, a, as an exemplar project, I think that is really powerful. So um, yes, that, that's uh, worth worth its weight in gold, really. Um, yeah. Anne, I can see that you have, sorry, Michael, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, I was, I was just gonna say, say that the, the more examples people see of alternatives to just going and buying a, 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 a tacky box from a, from a major, the better, because there are so many problems. I mean, you know, there, there, there are so many sharp practices now, which are just happening. Uh, in plain sight, with poor workmanship, you know, ground re uh, ground rents is on so many levels. Uh, the, the, the provision of housing in the UK, or at least in England, is broken. Uh, I actually think the more people are aware of that, the better, and the more people see the alternatives, the better. And that may help people to sort of uh, think twice before they just go out and buy a, buy a conventional house. Maybe they'll invest that money in local community land trusts instead. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I think that the more the more diversity there is in what people are seeing as a as a housing provision, not necessarily a market, but just how the housing provision works, then uh, the better. There, there are some um, yeah, uh, some really useful lessons to be learned. <clears throat> Anne, I can see you have your hand up. I was just going to say uh, to Margaret, maybe looking at the co-housing uh, movement, uh, people coming together and uh, buying properties and then arranging how they live and work together, uh, big in sort of Switzerland, Germany and in uh, Denmark. Yes, I have um, considered co-housing. Again, that's it just takes so much time to bring it all together. And I've got well, people in my group now who are struggling and saying I need you know i need i need to move well that's what i was just saying to, I, I just put something in the comment in the chat box to michael's comment about people don't have the time here we are in a, 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 a we've set up life that most families require two people to even just to make sort of go to work to make ends meet and things like that and the energy and time it takes to do something different mm -hmm. uh, is, is very difficult and, and but it's also so ingrained with us that idea that you you get a job you buy a house you have a mortgage um that even people who i thought would see things slightly differently still have anxiety about it so i teach at uclan and we had a conversation in my planning class for second year students about sort of where they would like to live and things like that and the moment we mentioned sort of timber framed houses and things like that they were like no no i want a brick house it was like oh my god you know and i would have thought you'd have been the sort of educated group that that might sort of you know have this so I think there's a lot of work to be, it's that sort of, I keep talking about apples. Apparently there are 166 different apple varieties just from the UK. Yet when we go to the supermarket, we're sold that there's six and that's apparently giving us choice and things like that. And it's the same with the housing market. They go three bedroom, detached, ensuite, there's your choice. And actually that isn't a choice, it, it's shocking. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Can I also recommend the um, the Facebook group, which Chris Coates, who's um, doing senior co-housing, who is in the next session, he's actually one of the admins of this, this Facebook group, D Diggers and Dreamers. And uh, it's a mix of people. Some people are on there. Oh, you know it, Margaret. Yeah, because <laughs> it references different ways of living and you don't necessarily need money to join some of those groups and, and be part of yeah. those. Too. I think most of them have joined my group as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you got your hand up to speak? Yeah, I just I just want to quickly say I feel like um, we're we're on the, a bit of a cusp at the moment culturally because um, with when the more we see of this, then the more it will become culturally culturally acceptable. We're looking at Germany; they have lifelong rental agreements, so they can live in a safe and secure, happy world because they know that's taken care of. There's no consistent drive to buy. Um, whereas, you know, when we, we're, we're taking a step back really by going looking at community again, 
Um, I work for the well community, so it is about community. And to me, um, as a psychologist, my my world revolves around looking at how people work together. And I've been dead against <laughs> the the idea of people competing and the constant drive for such a long time. It's been absolutely refreshing to sit and speak to people who are, are doing it. They're at, you're you're all actually making strides towards it. And it's really exciting for me because I feel a bit out on in cold a lot of the time when I'm talking to people about housing because I feel, you know I'm I'm not around people that might necessarily feel the same as me about building communities in this way. I think what Charles is as um when we look at the the way that's laid laid out where communities are going to be growing together and the kids playing together without worrying about cars those tiny things they're going to be great i want to move in i'm happy to move the <laughs> child if you've got a free house let me know <laughs> i will take it um so yeah thank you for inviting me i'm absolutely genuinely inspired it's great really appreciate it that's lovely to hear thank you nicola thank you yeah. and we'll be in touch we'll keep in touch um, Michael, you still have your hand up. I'm not sure if that's oh, a, a legacy. That's fine. Okay. Uh, well, oh, only oh. well, only, only that uh, that um, we do need to call out. It's interesting because characterising what the problems are does lead to a conversation around that, where you then see what the um, what the issues are around adoption of alternatives, as as Anne pointed out. And in other contexts, I've experienced this as well. We are fed a certain narrative that there are only certain life choices available to us. And a, a, a case in point for me was a a, 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 young, a girl who left uh, Lancaster Girls Grammar School. She, she took a gap year. She sort of fell into a gap year, this practical experience. And all her friends went on to university. And she said that was the only option that was given to them. So it's like calling out the limit, the, the paucity of options that are pre presented to us, um, and then having a conversation around that does seem, seem to stimulate the desire for people to look for what is out there that's an alternative. And almost in every case, the alternative is better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's right. I think we, we keep the conversation live by showing how it can be done differently, and that, that's really helpful, yeah. Sue, last question to you, I think. Yeah, it's really more of a, um, I'm sorry to say, a political comment, which is that um, successive governments have always fostered the idea that the aim in life is to buy your own home as young as possible. And as, sorry who it was, was saying in Germany, you have these long, long leases, and I think it's the same in France, where to rent a house is not considered, you know, infra dig. And I think the whole sort of attitude towards buying and renting has to be totally reversed so that renting is good and, and buying is sort of fairly useless, really. So that's what I'd like to see, a, a whole headset change. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. I think I think looking at what's going on um, abroad does give some some alternate, uh, you know, some different ways of looking at things. But it's um, always interesting to try and retrofit that into our um, our own regulations and our own um, uh, expectations. And as you've all commented, it's about mindset. It's about what we believe to be the best or the right way of doing things and what, what, we've, what we've understood um, as we've, we've grown up and become more independent or made our choices. It's, it's really um, fairly ingrained um, stuff that we're, we're rubbing up against here. Okay, um, we're winding up towards 11 o'clock. So um, all I'm going to do now is to thank you all very much, but particular thanks to Andrew and Charles um, for their contributions. Charles, I'm really sorry that you've had such difficulty joining us and thank you for coming along and um, uh, getting involved in the way that you can. Thank you very much to Becky um, and Lucy for holding the thought on, on delivering those words for, for you, Charles. Um, we will share the presentations and um, we would love to keep in touch with you um, and make sure that you know none of us are missing opportunities to, to help one another and um, continue our, our local conversations where we can. So um, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll be in touch following the event with, with the information from today's um, conversation. And um, 
uh, hopefully hopefully see projects progressing as, as along the way um question from margaret can i share the presentation publicly um can i just get a thumbs up from andrew and charles charles i think has said we can share his um information but perhaps we'll just wait for comment on that <laughs> charles saying <laughs> lucy and becky did it much better than he would have <laughs> Um, and thank you very much. Okay, so that's a yes on both um, on both presentations. Lovely. Right. Um, I'm going to call it a day there. Thank you very much all for joining us. And I think some of you are signed up to, to more of this later on today. So um, uh, we'll see, see some of you later. But um, uh, very, very grateful for your time this morning. I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much. Bye bye.